One of the paradoxes in the Buddhist teachings is that on the one hand we're told to be patient, and on the other we're told to have a sense of urgency. One teaching tells us to slow down, the other one teaches us to speed up. So how do you put those two together? Well, think about times when you've been in an airport. You get to your gate and you discover that they found a technical problem with the airplane. There's going to be a delay. And part of you wants them to hurry up and fix the, the problem. And the other part realizes if they're in too much of a hurry, they may actually miss something important. You could die if they're too quick, too much of a hurry to get things done. So you think of the mechanics there. On the one hand, they do have to have a sense of urgency, but they also have to be patient enough to do things very carefully, to do them right. And a lot of this comes down to what it means to be observant. You want the mechanic to be observant. And that means, on the one hand, being slow enough to observe things, and on the other hand, being quick enough to observe things. Slow in the sense that you don't want to jump to any conclusions before you really have all the evidence in, and quick in the sense that you want to catch the subtle things as they come and go, come and go. And the qualities come together when the mind is really still, with a sense of alertness and a sense of mindfulness. So when you're working with the breath, on the one hand this means being very patient, to observe the breath, to see what really does feel comfortable. And then when you have a sense of comfort, allowing that sense of ease to spread through the body without pushing it, without forcing it. Because if you force it too much, it's not going to be ease anymore, it's not going to be comfort anymore. So think of whatever qualities you have to develop to be observant in some area where you are already skilled. Both the patience and the quickness, the slowness and the quickness. And try to bring those same qualities to what you're doing right here, right now. If the mind wanders off, you want to be quick to bring it back. Is the skill we're working on here right now. Although it ultimately does require watching the mind, watching the thoughts that come into the mind. The first order of business is to be able to pull out of those thoughts whenever you have to, because to watch the thought you have to get out of it. That means as soon as you notice that you're wandering away, just drop the thought. You don't have to Tie up the loose ends. You don't have to make a note to come back to it later. Just drop it. Come back to the breath. And that ability to drop it turns into a habit. So you can call on it whenever you, whenever you need to. There's that old story of the person having a dream. You're in a boat. And there's one, two person one too many people in the boat. And there's your mother and there's your father and they're all the members of your family. And you know that if everybody stays in the boat, everybody's going to die. One person has to leave. And you're asked to choose. What do you do? And if you really get into the narrative, you get yourself all tied up. But if you remember, hey, this is a dream. Just get out of the dream. That's it. So that's the kind of skill you want to develop as you're meditating and dealing with thoughts, however strong and important they may seem. For the time being, you put them aside. Say, the skill I need right now is the skill of getting out. And to help further that skill, that's when you need the sense of well-being in the body, because you have a nice place to go. Because for the most part, the reason we go into those thought worlds is because we're looking for something, looking for some kind of satisfaction. Even the negative emotions have their attractions. 
And the best way to see that attraction is to give yourself something better, a better place to go, a better place to be. So trying to develop this sense of well-being with the breath. So that as soon as you notice that you've slipped off, you just drop it, whatever the thought is, come right back. And if you find that the thought is insistent, that you keep going back and back and back to it, that's when you have to develop some discernment. Remind yourself of the drawbacks of that kind of thinking. If you were to allow yourself to indulge in that kind of thinking for 24 hours, where would it lead you? What kind of state would you be in at the end of the 24 hours? Do you really want to induce that kind of state in the mind? Or you can simply think of it as a movie you've seen many, many, many times before. You know what Humphrey Bogart is going to say. You know what all the characters are going to say. Why do you want to watch it again? And you come right down to it. It's not Humphrey Bogart. If your thoughts were put up on a movie screen, would you want to pay to see them? You can think in this way. It's a lot easier to drop the thinking. And if you find that it keeps coming back, then you re make up your mind for the time being, I'm just going to ignore it. We know that therapists say to allow yourself to feel the emotion and to get into the emotion. Don't be in denial. Well, you're not in denial when you're developing the skill of pulling out. You're pulling out knowing what you're doing. In denial, you pretend that it's not happening, that you don't have those feelings, that you don't have those thoughts. But here we're not denying it, no, simply asking ourselves to develop a new skill. So when the thought arises, you say, I'm going to stay here with the breath. The thought can be in another part of the mind, but I'm simply not going to pay it any attention. And this allows you to get in with the breath and realize that even though the thought may be there, you don't have to get sucked into it. This is a really important skill. Because for most of us, as soon as a thought arises, we have to get into it. It's like finding a piece of clothing lying on the floor, and you feel that you have to get into that piece of clothing and take on whatever role it is. If it's a soldier's uniform, you suddenly become a soldier. If it's an apron, you have to become a cook, whatever. But here you just put it aside. You say, okay, there's a piece of clothing on the floor, but I don't have to go there. I don't have to get into it. Because if you're going to understand your thinking, you have to have this ability to watch the thoughts from an outside perspective. So one of the ways of doing that is simply to say, I'm going to stay here with the breath. The thought can go chattering on as much as it wants. And usually these thoughts are like crazy people. They they want to get your attention, and they'll say anything outrageous they can. But you just have to be firm that you're not going to go there. You're not going to even look at them. You know they're there, but you're not going to look at them. And ultimately, they'll lose their interest, go away. If they don't, another technique is to simply notice where in the body is the tension that goes along with the thought. If you notice it, when the thought comes in, there's going to be, say, tension in your back or in your face, in your neck, someplace in the body. Once you notice that, breathe through it. Allow it to relax. Think of yourself as atomizing the tension and allowing it to blow away. The final technique in the arsenal that the Buddha recommends is that if the thought just keeps coming back, coming back, coming back, in spite of all these other approaches, you stick your tongue against the roof of your mouth, you clench your teeth, and just say, I will not think that thought. If you have a meditation word like bhutto, you just kind of jam the airwaves with that bhutto, 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 or whatever the meditation word may be. This, of all the techniques, is the one that involves the least discernment, but you know, the times when you need it. 
It's just not the case that we always have to treat our thoughts with kid gloves. And you realize that having aversion for the thoughts is not going to help. Again, it's like that problem of being trying to be too quick or too slow. If the aversion just tries to chase the thought away, that's the kind of thinking that ends up in denial and just creates more tension, more frustration. And then, of course, the, the unskillful thought is going to go underground, it's going to sneak around for a while, and they come up with a big tentacle like the thing, which you don't want. So in the same way that you try to develop skillful qualities by combining patience and urgency, it's the same way with unskillful thoughts, unskillful qualities. You don't hate them, but you try to be quick in noticing them, and you try to be thorough and patient. And so I've got to clear, clear some space here. Because the whole problem with these distracting thoughts is the when you get into them, when you get sucked into them, then all of a sudden they color everything you see. At the very least, you have to be able to step out. It's okay, there's that thought there, but I'm here. And in the beginning, as long as the here is not really solid, you don't want to get too involved in observing the thought. You want to make the sense of being here with the breath really, really solid. And then you're in a much better position where you can actually observe the thought and understand it and figure out, well, why is it that there's this attraction to that kind of thinking? What kind of miserable nourishment do I get out of it? And it's easy to see that kind of nourishment when you have something better to feed on. That's why we feed on the breath, feed on the sense of ease that we can develop in the body. So you can catch the mind as it goes looking for other pleasures, and see those other pleasures for what they are, that they really aren't worth it. That's what this all comes down to, is that we're really trying to learn how to be observant, to watch things carefully. And that requires a whole panoply of skills, knowing when to be quick, when to be slow, when to be gentle, when to be forceful. So again, think of the mechanic on the plane. On the one hand, you want to be quick enough so that you can get the plane off in time, or at least not make the passengers wait too long. But on the other hand, you want to do a thorough job so that you don't miss anything that suddenly malfunctions when they're up at 35,000 feet. to try to develop this combination of patience and urgency that allows you to be observant, that allows you to be both slow and quick, so you can deal effectively with the problems at hand. And that's what it's all about. We are solving a problem here, recognizing there is a problem. The mind's causing itself suffering, and there is a solution. Is that all? Another paradox is, on the one hand, we don't have much time, on the other hand, we have all the time in the world. If you don't finish the job in this lifetime, well, you come back and try it again and again. But on the other hand, that coming back involves a f large amount of suffering. So if there is something you can observe now, something you can deal with right now, you don't want to wait. This is what the best attitude to have is one of timelessness. You're watching what's happening right here, right here. It's always right here, right now. And you do what you can right here, right now. That way it's neither slow nor quick, it's just right.